So we'll have this recording for them as well when they wake up. Sweet. Sweet, sweet. Okay. Um, anyone else you can think of that you're that you're waiting on rolling in, or can we go ahead and start? We should be clear to start. Okay. I'm just going to pull I'm, – I'm popping out the chat so I can keep our, our questions channel open. One second. All right, let's begin. Uh, so yeah, thank you guys for coming on. Um, why don't we go around? You guys can each introduce yourselves and you know, kind of give your role in the project, and then um, you know, whoever wants to take lead on your side can give us kind of the the rundown on Mythic X. Sure, absolutely. So we are Mythic X. That's the we because we are a team. There's multiple members of Mythic X. Um, I'm, of course, legendary. That's the name that I go by to everybody. Um, I have a background in IT. I'm from traditional IT. I spent over a decade as a web developer and also a mobile app developer, along with uh, being a solutions architect in the IT space. I have also have now recently moved over to the venture capitalist space and spent the last three years in the venture um, capitalist realm. And I will pass it over to my teammate, Rick, to give a little bit of background on himself. Yeah, um, so I'm rec apologizing in advance. My, I'm I've been sick the past past week or so, so my voice is still pretty bad. But um, yeah, so I'm Rick. I actually my background is in investment banking, so I do a lot in my day job. I do a lot of IPOs, follow-ons, SPACs, ATMs. Any type of um, equity transaction is something that I'm typically a part of. And one of the reasons I got interested in DeFi was because a lot of what I do in my day job deals with capital structures, which is, you know, tokenomics, I guess, but for companies. So, Battle, do you want to give right. a little short? Yeah, sure. So I come from a background kind of similar to Rick, uh, where I work in kind of the private equity kind of asset management type world, kind of investing in all sorts of companies. Uh, I, work, I work at like a pretty large fund. Uh, you probably recognize the name, uh, if you, especially if you're in finance circles. But um, yeah, got pretty interested in the crypto space. I was fascinated by uh, what's possible. Uh, obviously, coming from a tra traditional finance background, uh, you kind of see what's really cool and possible with with tokenomic structures, and specifically kind of the, the right ones, or like a different way of incentivization and uh, really equity and all these other things at at their most primitive le primitive level. So yeah, that's my background. Awesome, thanks. Okay, um, and now, yeah, can we get kind of an overview of the project itself? Sure, absolutely. And not to leave out my other teammate, because um, I definitely wouldn't want to leave them out as well. We have, um, our devs are really, really good in this space. You might have recognized some of the projects that they worked on. If you've read our white paper, you know that they worked on some really powerhouse projects. And of course, like on the business side, uh, we have a lot of people on our team, as you've seen with Rick and Battle's background, and even also Mythic, who has master's degrees, uh, multiple master's degrees in various areas of um, finance and business. Uh, a lot of us really have a lot of experience as entrepreneurs. The DeFi space itself, really um, being able to create these type of projects that have went on to be successful in both TradeFi and then also DeFi as well. But also just to talk about the protocol a little bit, so what we really are is a next-gen GameFi protocol. What we've been able to do is really combine the best of multiple different projects, some of them such as Tomb and also DeFi Kingdoms, and take the best out of each of these protocols and then build something that is completely unique and then has the GameFi mechanics so that it's also really engaging for the community. Um, that's just the high-level overview. I'll leave it to Rick and Battle to go ahead and dive more into detail. Yeah, thanks, Rick. Absolutely. So, if we take a step back, we initially started this project back in January, and we originally started it as just pure pure play DeFi project. You know, like um, something you see. It, it was essentially the same framework that we have here, but without the game file elements. And Originally, we we're going to go with that, but then took a step and thought, like, okay, we can make this a lot more engaging. We are 
the interactions that we're allowing our community to have and the users to have when they're in our protocol kind of call for a more like you could you could spice it up a bit so that's kind of where the game file elements came from but we initially started this project on how can we fix you know something like strong block like wh where did strong block really go wrong you know and like legendary was saying, saying this project kind of became a culmination of a lot of more traditional node type projects as well as tomb as well as more traditional game five projects like DeFi kingdoms um identifying like where they went wrong and then kind of combining how we can mix it so the initial idea was okay how can we create a more sustainable node or okay. a more sustainable node type project and that's kind of like where we stemmed off of and then it took so many different system turns until we were here now so <laughs> that's a it's a little background on where we where we started okay awesome um yeah, so um, I kind of, you know, I did some some brief, you know, I kind of went through the the white paper and whatnot, and I think I kind of understand the the idea. So it's you guys have these land NFTs, um, which so it kind of seems like those are the node portion, and then you have your seniorage token, you know, with the fortune and the myth token on the other side, um, that's trying to peg itself to to Matic, right? Yeah, so. We're taking a more DeFi Kingdoms jewel approach than okay. a Tomb T-share approach. So that peg is important for, I guess, a later phase in our okay. project's life cycle. At the current moment, we have no plans of kind of getting our fortune token to that uh, Matic price, right? It, we're okay. not trying to chase that peg, like, you know, we're, we're not trying to ride that line, you know, if, gotcha. if Jewel was supposed to be worth a dollar and it's like six bucks, like more power to Jewel, right? Like we're, right, not, right. we're not trying to like, yeah. So our project, I think at its core, it has a similar framework to what Tomb was trying to do, but we're taking a lot of the elements DeFi Kingdoms did, putting them all together and then, you know, coming out with something that we think is like very unique and should be refreshing the node like you said you're right to say that the land is very much what the nodes are what's important to know about the nodes is that one they're only accessible to people on the whitelist at this moment okay and two there's only a limited supply of it um these are not compounding nodes they're something you buy a number of a fixed number of in the beginning and then we never issue any more uh, okay. If we did issue any more, it'd be much later on for a much, much higher price because if you read, if, like you said, you were reading the some of the white paper, which we encourage everyone to um, to do, if you read about like, okay, these nodes kind of transcend the normal protocol and what you kind of do and they actually benefit from the protocol growing, um, the value that the users get for buying these pieces of land really early are so crazy to, if the project really scales up, um, which allows us to, like I just said, like scale up effectively without oversaturating our own market or anything like that, because right. there's so many different burn mechanics already implemented, but the nodes itself, because there's only a limited supply, um, they don't really have to worry about a lot of them as much. Okay. So are these nodes, are they going to be able to be tradable? Between, yeah. okay. And now yeah. is that going to be on like your own marketplace or can users use, you know, something like Tofu or NF Trade or something like that? Or I think NF Trade's just, just, uh, just AVAX, but. Um, yeah, we're actually planning to put it on OpenSea. Um, trying to okay, get nice. accessibility wherever. It's a Polygon project. Um, a lot of game Fi type projects are on Polygon. So we probably just put it on OpenSea because it's just the most user traction. But yeah, of um, course. Yeah, uh, that's one of the cool things about this project is that you're not just buying, they're, they're not a traditional node, like we were saying earlier. They're stakeable NFTs that act similarly to a node. But Gotcha. So it's like a yield-bearing NFT versus, you know, like a, a, a node per se. Exactly, yeah. Okay. But that, that was kind of like where it stemmed from initially, where it's like, this is like our equivalent of a node or what we think a node like could or should be. Okay. So... So I buy one of these NFTs. Can you go through kind of the like the next steps? How do I? Because I, I'm you know I'm going through your white paper now, and 
you know, you have your 200%, 250, 300% APR on the nodes, plus the fees, which we'll get into later. But can you kind of go through that process of, okay, I, I bought my land NFT, I stake it, now what? Yeah, so that's a good question. Right now, we're very, very early on in the process. Um, okay. I just want to let everyone cool. know that. This is quite literally like step one in our multi-step process. So step one is doing this pre-sale of identifying, building the community. We love our community. Our community is super, super, super great. Like they're super active in chat, very excited about um, where we're, what we're doing, but growing this community. And then eventually after this stays, we're doing a more traditional bootstrap event. This is where the tomb element comes in. A bootstrap event to bootstrap the myth token as well as fortune token. Okay. So node holders or land holders, sorry, um, are not going to really see the um, benefits until that bootstrap happens. Because once that bootstrap happens, then the protocol, I guess, would turn on, quote unquote, right? Um, okay. But in that time, remember, like I said, they're NFTs. Like you can transfer them, you can sell them, you can do whatever you want. You know, it, it's not like a sunk cost type thing. But yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Um, like when do you guys expect that portion to start? Cause it sounds like you're kind of, you know, this is this, this NFT sale is kind of like an early C level raise. Is that, is that accurate? And then, uh, you yeah, know. no. So right. As soon as this is done, then we kind of start step two, like almost immediately where most okay. of a lot of the, um, what, what we raise is going to be kind of just like re put back into the protocol, either through marketing or you know, building out the next layer of like what we're trying to do. Gotcha. Um, That's my next question. Awesome. Yeah. So, well, okay. we're so taking it our extreme this year too. So let me just add like a, a few points sure. uh, kind of through so this whole whole thing that we're talking about. So I think point one that's really important to understand about this protocol is when we say about like what we're trying to solve, we're really trying to solve for kind of this excess uh, minting that we kind of see kind of happening over and over and over and again in DeFi that tends to lead to a giant pump and then like there's just more and more tokens but either not utility or use use or just more and more printing and that just causes these these tokens to, to crash um and so for us we, we've kind of built in different mechanisms pulled from stuff like tomb and things but also create our own kind of burn mechanisms which is part of the fees that are being paid it's a specific kind of what we call a, a ratio between the, the the myth and fortune price, which will impact the amount of fortune being printed. And that's something that we can kind of change the same way that like a, a central bank can change their interest rate or can buy bonds or not buy bonds. Um, okay. Basically, it's meant to be reactive uh, as opposed to, I think a lot of uh, DeFi protocols in general tend to put all the rules up front and then like if a market movement that goes against what those rules were supposed to do, they can't really change it, you know? Um, and that's just not how the real world works. The real world works in, in a way where you can't really predict the future, you can only react to it, right. especially in a macroeconomic type environments. And so we've kind of built like um, our protocols to kind of be able to pull those levers to make sure that our protocol is healthy around kind of what's being printed and making sure that like we can kind of somewhat manage that supply so that we don't like completely overprint uh, as, as kind of happens with most most no, most kind of uh, DeFi type pro projects because there's just too much too much of the token. Um, yeah. Points. Or what I'll say is uh, just on another point is uh, when we talk about this this pre sale right and what this land is it, in a way you are right right like it is kind of a, a seed type investment um, and that seed money is going to go to do our audit and and KYC which we've already contracted Oxcar and obviously like. Two of our devs are doxed, so we're all privately doxed, but I'm um, just for, for comfort. And then after that, we're going to do our bootstrap launch. We're going to be raising like a, um, a lot more money. Uh, but basically, like our, our back end smart contracts are basically mostly done. Um, we're working on the front end. So really, it's going to be a question of when the community is built, plus uh, when these things are completed, when we sort of launch this protocol. Um, Right now, the the kind of soft moving target is call it like a month, a month and a week from now, or like a month and a month, a month and a half from now. Um, so like that's kind of like what you can uh, expect for the actual sort of call it protocol launch. But okay. uh, that's sort of like the the general timeline. Uh, and there's going to be one other pre-sale a few weeks from now as well. This first pre-sale is a pretty small amount of money, relatively speaking. And again, meant to kind of uh, really bootstrap this whole process. 
Okay, awesome. Um, yeah, so can one of you guys go over the the two tokens and kind of how they interact? And, you know, I guess you can also kind of go over the questing system as well. I really like the idea. Super cool. Um, but yeah, just, just to kind of give everyone an idea of how those tokens will work and maybe also like the long-term vision, you know, of pegging it to Matic and how that's going to work as well. Yeah, I, I think I can take the lead here. Um, so the initial system is, let's say you just bootstrapped, you got some uh, a little bit of fortune and a bunch of myth, and you don't know what to do. Okay, so the first step is you're going to take your myth and you're going to stake it. And then when staking myth, you're going to create what we call a character. And this character is essentially how you'll go on what we call quests, which um, are different events that usually last around five days. So when you're going on a quest after five days, you have three stats as a character. Each stat correlates to a different um, uh, either APR percent, time spent questing, or, um, or like fail rate. So these three stats are kind of what we operate around. So when you create a quest, when you go on a quest and you finish your quest, you'll get a certain amount of fortune at the end of that five day period. Okay. That return then is in your claim chest or your treasure chest at the end. In order to claim your chest, you have to fully heal your character, but you could, instead of fully healing, you could just go on another quest. But each time you go on each subsequent quest, your stats would re get reduced by one. And each time your stats get reduced, your APR would get reduced, your fail likelihood would increase and stuff. So there's incentives to get more involved in the protocol, but the agency is always left with the user. If the user doesn't want to pay any fees and they just want to keep questing, like power to them, like they don't have to pay any fees. Um, the way we've optimized this is that there is a like optimal method to play it. We're not going to tell anyone like what that is. It's more about the people who are really involved in the protocol, like we'll figure it out and they'll kind of get the best return. Um, then once, so once you, let's say you finish your questing, you fully hear the character, your character is like chilling. Um, and then you claim your fortune. Okay. Then what the fortune at the end you claim, this is kind of where we draw from the tomb part where the only way to receive myth is to then stake fortune again. So the, amount of myth we release is going to be released on a fixed schedule. That way it's not overbearing and how much is, um, is printed and subsequently like how much gets printed, how much fortune would get printed, et cetera. So because of that, that fixed amount of fortune entering, um, or a fixed amount of myth and then the, the, the protocol is equally distributed to all everyone staking fortune. So in a nutshell, that's kind of like how that ebb and flow would work. Um, but there's a ton of different, um, mechanics involved, including whenever you heal a certain stat, the money that you spent healing that stat would go to holders of that specific node or that piece of land. So for instance, gotcha. in the tavern, this is our first, uh, our first sale, um, tavern holders are, um, the, the first stat, which, uh, correct me if I'm wrong battle, but I believe it's the, um, it's the APR health, percent. I think, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's it's health and APR percent. So if you go on a quest and your um, health goes down by one tick, as it would, um, if you wanted to heal that stat up, you pay that fee to fortune holders or to um, tavern holders. Sorry. So it's a very cyclical process where, in an effort to like scale up, people would then be staking more um, more myth and then paying fortune to those holders so um okay ultimately it's kind of this whole system to kind of keep the money flowing keep everyone um involved there is isn't most efficient way to play um but all the while like battle was alluding to earlier we can always be checking how healthy our protocol is just by you know the current price of things how much transactions are actually happening and then adjusting that ratio between how much myth one myth prints of fortune. So there's a fixed ratio. So they're very much tied to each other. Um, okay. So yeah, that was going to be my question was how, so you get fortune as a reward for completing a quest and then you have to, 
you kind of you exchange that for myth and I'm like I'm wondering how would a user go to and, and take profit from the rewards from a quest uh, yeah. can you like is there going to be a market value on fortune that they could just swap yeah, back yeah. Or do they have to go and swap to myth to be able to to sell no 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 absolutely so the only way to get fortune to get more myth is either to buy it or to um to stake the fortune if you want to earn money on your fortune you just stake fortune and you earn myth right okay so like at any moment of... you could sell either one for okay you know, okay USDC, like whatever you want right um so myth is kind of like your fuel forget for for or, yeah for exactly. putting your character yeah okay awesome now the interesting thing is i've recently and maybe you guys have as well there's been a lot of like nft projects launching recently and there are some of them are more in in line with what we do in DeFi, which is you know creating these cool protocols in like creating different places for people to put money and having money flow around the ecosystem, et cetera. But a lot of these projects want to focus on the game. They don't want to focus on making a token. They don't want to focus mm. on the heartache of like, oh, I need something that I can burn and I need something, but it also has value and stuff like that. And like, but I don't know right. how to do that, right? The, the tokenomics to try to keep it actually afloat. Exactly. So the beauty of this project is we solve that question for a lot of people. Um, there, like, I, I haven't even been on that many spaces, like, in all honesty, like, I've probably been on, like, a dozen or so spaces where, but I keep hearing this thing where it's, like, I want to make this project, but I need something to support the token, or I need some fuel to make this thing actually operate. Gotcha. Our ecosystem is designed to be implemented in any of those projects. Okay. That's awesome. I love to hear that. Um... So I'm just going through, I had a question here. So on your white paper, it says that um, as you lose your, as you lose health, which is one of your three stats, um, it gets reduced by 5% for each quest completed um, to a minimum of 75%. So is, is it possible to not complete a quest? Like, is it possible that you could fail if you're, if you run out of one of your stats my part of the way through I'm not, like is there a, is yeah, there a yeah. mechanic there where yeah so I'll, just quickly in case anyone hasn't read the white paper um which i assume most of you guys who are listening haven't um health is one of the stats it decreases apr percent or apy percent so let's say let's use big numbers here let's say at a fixed rate you have 100 percent apy if you drop down one tick of health you'll go down to 95 percent for that quest okay um okay the second stat would be armor. Armor dictates it, the likelihood you are to complete a quest at all. So it's the same 5% as the previous one. And it's actually the same um, like expected value from like a, a mass function, but it feels a lot worse if you lose, <laughs> right? Because okay. if you don't fully, um, if you don't fully like, you know, heal that thing, there's always a risk you fail. Um, so this is more of like aligned with how optimal people want to play. This is how risk more people who are maybe more risk tolerant could just like say, you know, I'm not paying that fee. I'm just going to tank it and just, cause I know I'm not going to fail. Right. Gosh. And you take that, power that little gamble. Yeah, exactly. The final stat is um, stamina, which you heal at the temple. The temple dictates how long a quest takes. So the initial quest, is five days um after you your five days you finish your quest great your all your stats move down one tick now the next quest you do is going to take six and then seven and then eight and then nine and then finally ten um okay the caveat to all of this is you can't have more than one stat at zero out of five so you can play however you want there is a most efficient method but depending on what you care about depending on how interactive you want to be in this protocol, there's something for everyone. So. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so kind of more on the long-term side, what, you know, once, cause I'm looking at the recruitment section, um, mm -hmm. which it sounds like is your guys kind of like, you know, your boardroom, you know, um, like your bonding kind of mechanic to, you know, if it falls below peg, um, can you explain how that's going to work in mythic? 
yeah. and how it's kind of different from, you know, a typical tomb seniorage token. Yeah, absolutely. So like I said, there's a lot of ways that we generate fees and the goal is not in the fact that we're holding this peg. I think a lot of tomb projects go wrong because they want to just ride this line all day, right? They just want to like ride that line like super, yeah. super thin. And then as soon as they go under, the likelihood a project recovers, a tomb fork recovers from going under peg is near zero, right? Um, any project that does it like is definitely worth like looking into further because their community is great. Clearly. Right, because someone has to have faith yeah. enough to, to buy into the, you know, to buy in to get the reward once it's back above peg. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, from our perspective, we never want to ride that line. Okay. But the line is there for people who want to adopt our project or adopt our token saying, hey, like, this line is here. Like, we are guaranteeing with this protocol, the protocol will keep functioning as long as we are above peg of Matic. Right. So that's like the minimum for this project. So any project that wants to adapt our project or our token knows going into it, okay, like this is essentially Matic, but there might be a more, a little premium on it or a pretty, whatever type of premium is on it. Like they know, like from the back of their head, okay, our project can use this as an equivalent of Matic. But in yeah. case it does go under peg, we do have a lot of different mechanisms mostly involving similar to what tomb does where you know the whole thing kind of slows down or stops or it slows down as we're approaching this but as battle said we kind of operate similar to a central bank in the sense that we can adjust these interest rates going into it so if we are approaching this you know we can act accordingly um but that being said um well if let's say worst case scenario happens like it goes under peg that's fine we enter recruitment mode a lot more um, types of utilities kind of get implemented and sold out to people to kind of help bring this thing back up of peg. The interesting thing about this project is that this is all phase one and phase okay. one is like pretty similar, is pretty simple, I'd say. Phase two is where it gets really cool, but also more complex. So our goal for phase two is to launch maybe a couple months, maybe like three or four months after uh, phase one launches. The goal for phase two is to have every single character be an NFT. And those characters mm. can equip equipment, which boosts or gives you a different types of utility or okay. gives your character like different types of rewards. Or maybe, you know, with this item, it's a fixed five days. You don't, you don't have to pay the, the temple fee or whatever. Or with this item, you know, it'll increase my APR, but it'll decrease or the likelihood of completing a quest or something like that, right? So okay. allowing people to kind of choose how they want to play and prioritize certain things and maybe maximize their APR or whatever it wants. So, but all of those are different ideas for us to kind of create, I mean, in, to create more future uh, burn mechanics as well as reward people who are in our community that have access to buy these with the fortune they've approved. So. Awesome. I, I, that I just, sounds really cool. I like that. I just oh. add like a, uh, a couple of pieces, right? Like we're talking about this in terms of kind of utilities and use cases for the community. The utility is obviously printing the fortune um, and kind of making profit that way for the for the landholders. The profits obviously like when you're printing the fortune and like the fees you're getting paid um, part of it as part of it, plus sort of just like the fact that it's an NFT, if the protocol does well, then the NFT value is probably gonna jump as well. Um, but the, the part of it that's actually going to be like a big part of this protocol in the medium to long term is really like pushing it towards the uh, Matic ecosystem again by having, I think Rick mentioned, right, like other NFT projects or games like find value in our token or having other people find token rights. It's very, very similar. And we like to use this analogy of like what MIM did uh, in AVAX in a way, very much so kind of just like started pushing it everywhere. And then once you have like this token that is accepted as this like store of value to, I guess, the, the US dollar in this case, but some sort of a store of value, then all of a sudden you can do all sorts of other things with it. And so like, it's meant to be like a, trying to find like the right path to get to that point in the medium term is kind of what we're aiming for okay. uh, within the Matic ecosystem, right? So we're gonna get to there through, hopefully through a di few different ways. One is just through these game mechanics, which eventually will kind of uh, 
make this a, a game five protocol that people just want to like individually invest in. But then also like we we think that we can then also use this token to to go to other kind of projects in both the game and outside the game space. And then there's all sorts of cool things you can do like once once you kind of have a little bit more kind of uh, uh, exposure and acknowledgement of, of your token in in the ecosystem. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, what was the decision to build on Matic versus, you know, like AVAX, Phantom, or, you know, one of the other ones? Yeah, so um, for us, like, Matic is, uh, it's, it's, it's kind of like the, uh, if you believe, like, that ETH is going to be there, it's going to be New York or whatever, right? Like, um, then the layer twos are, are going to be, like, kind of the, the ones which you kind of see as, like, the, the safer, safer bets on ETH, bet on ETH even, even moving forward. But Matic just kind of has the one of the best teams in terms, in terms of just being something for everyone. Uh, they have the right kind of devs. They kind of bring people in. Um, there's a lot of game pie on there already. Uh, yeah, there's not yeah. really that many uh, different kind of protocols like this. Or like, I, I, There's less DeFi, I'd say, on Matic than like on AVAX or Phantom or things like that, too. Um, and then you also have like a lot of big headline companies kind of using Matic as, as kind of their, their main goal. Like Facebook and Meta just announced that their, their quote-unquote NFTs are going to be on on Matic or use Matic as kind of the, the validator, right? And you oh, have like, really? I hadn't heard yeah. that. That's, that's exciting. Wow. Yeah. So like, I think there's just like a lot of uh, people like when they when they ask themselves, where do I want to fit? The first place they'll look at is ETH, and then they'll be like, oh shit, like Gatsby's and like yeah, Bonus, uh, and they're like, all right, what else is out there? I don't really know these other ones, but but oh, I've heard of like Matic or like I, I know that Matic is, is a layer too. And so we think that there's just a lot of wins. It's it's a relatively safer bet in terms of uh, uh, an ecosystem that, that sort of made a lot of sense. Because um, we we've been on we've been on Phantom, AVAX, we've seen those ecosystems, but for us, like this just felt like the best fit. And not to say that we're not going to go on some of these other ones kind of maybe later, but this to start and just the uh, the white space, I guess, is, is pretty high over here. Plus, I'm yeah. the biggest Matic fanboy. <laughs> No yeah, brainer no. for me. Oh uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm a huge fan of Matic. I know um, uh, I've been really uh, interested in Sphere and, and what they've building, what they've been building with with Penrose and and Dystopia and whatnot. Um, but yeah, so kind of going, you know, in line with the, you know, with the other chains. I saw uh, at the very end of your white paper for the future, it says campaigns in different realms. Now I take that as potentially cross chain. Is that is that accurate, or does that mean something else? Yeah, I mean, like it's it's kind of there is a vision to kind of go cross chain in the future. Um, so it does sort of mean that. It also means just kind of I think different campaigns. Like I know what DeFi kingdoms like they have their crystal thing or whatnot. So it's not it's not necessarily just that, but it's also very much so. Like a, a big part of this, right? is uh, we, we're building storylines and actual gameplay that goes along with the, the game fight, right? Or on being part of this realm, right? Like about this, uh, uh, Rick's going to kill me, Le Leviathan. I think I pronounced it right. <laughs> Thank God. Yeah, is it? <laughs> All right, yeah. So I, I keep pronouncing it Leviathan, and like he just keeps like yelling at me. He's like, <laughs> well, like, that's not how you pronounce this thing. Um, so, um, yeah, the Leviathan storyline, like uh, just, just these different things. Um, if you go to our Discord, we have a game bot that's a little bit like Dungeons and Dragons. So we're, we're gonna do like a lot of like things like that, where we're really emphasizing like the storyline and the gameplay uh, to kind of like make this more of that sort of a community that I think in pure DeFi projects. Well, while this is like by all intents and purposes a DeFi project, the story I think is like a differentiator in terms of the the game and what will end up being kind of the the gameplay. It's not going to be like an Assassin's Creed type gameplay or like a video game type gameplay per se, but it's going to be very much so like built around the story, the old school kind of like dungeon, Dungeons and Dragons type stuff. Oh, and so there's two different realms um, kind of that go with that also. I will also, awesome. I will also say um, before this was even a DeFi project uh, and Battle Ace and I even were, like, were involved, Legendary and Mythic originally wanted to just make a game. So that's where a lot of the inspiration even comes from in the first place. Um, yeah, just to add on kind of your hybrid. Oh, I'm sorry. No, you're good. I was just saying, so this is kind of like your hybrid, you know, game plus DeFi, you know, merge or whatnot. Yeah, and I was going to say, um, Battle did an excellent job of it, even breaking it down about how all of the lore kind of works into it. There's tons of storylines, and unlike Rick said, um, 
being that it was initially supposed to be a full game, um, and we were working with people from Pixar and everything, um, there's a lot of stuff that we've already developed that we're going to repurpose and kind of put it out in a really unique way. So we have a lot of exciting things in terms of interactivity. There's going to be a lot of different stories that will be told, different characters, different paths that the user can choose. And it's really interactive from the standpoint that even right now, um, with people getting on the white list, you're choosing a side. You're choosing the light path or you're choosing the dark path. Oh, okay. That'll have consequences down the line. And even the roles and everything in the Discord as well. It all ties into the Mythic Point system and how that's going to be rolled out in the future. It's going to be really interesting. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, so um, I, think, I think just to emphasize, right, like we're trying to pull a lot of the things that we saw we're working into this protocol, you know, um, from past protocols. And there was a lot of good, there was a lot of bad, right? And so like we tried to pull like some of the best things and we were like, all right, like where can we create, where can we innovate? Like if we take these parts from Tomb, if we take the storylines from like a lot of these interesting game game type projects um, or like the, the idea of the storylines, I should say, if we take like... Uh, you know, the, 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 the idea of like nodes and like printing, but limit it in the scale, <clears throat> scale up. There's only going to be like a few hundred max uh, of these things kind of in our, in our verse, kind of our, our pre of these lands, like to make it sustainable, like how, how does it all fit together? So that's kind of what we are trying to work on here. We're trying to truly build, I guess. Right, right. Can you guys talk a little bit about the sustainability? Uh, I kind of want to transition into that and some of the questions that we had in our in the Mythic channel. Um, it looks like for the the first question from Swedwin. Um, I think the first question was kind of answered, but the second one kind of goes in line with a question I had because um, you have your two two fifty three hundred percent APR rates, um, and so. I'll just, I'll just ask his question. He said, you mentioned sustainability quite a bit, and we've seen how hard it is to launch a native token due to sell pressure as more and more buyers come into the protocol. So can you tell me how you plan to prevent the value of the myth and the fortune tokens from bleeding out like other ones have done in the space? Ryan, you want to go? Yeah, yeah, I can go. Um, yeah, that's, that's a great question. Um, so... And this is honestly one of the first things uh, that we wanted to address. In any project we made, we wanted to make sure that we always kind of covered our bases in terms of what was sustainable and what wasn't. So the initial goal was to create a sustainable note, right? The way we came up with doing that was, first of all, limiting the amount of nodes so you can't just endlessly compound them. but the second part was, okay, now that we have this, where are, are is that money like, you know, quote unquote coming from? Mm -hmm. And that's actually where we came to the idea for, okay, why don't fees paid to heal certain stats kind of go to the holders of the landowners that are, you know, affiliated with those stats. So at a certain point, and because of the way we structured it, it's actually a quite low TVL um, relative to other projects. We can like 100% guarantee that the node fees that are generated like on a fixed rate, this is the only thing that's generated at a fixed rate, um, are 100% sustainable at a certain TVL. Um, okay. And that TVL, like I just said, is actually like fairly low. Well, well, okay, just to expand on that, right? Those fees, and I think we didn't really mention it as well kind of earlier, so we probably should have, but... The fees that are paid by these adventurers, like the vast majority of them are actually going to get burned. Um, so it's kind of a burn mechanism within our within our system. And then a piece of them are going to get airdropped to kind of the different landowners. And obviously, like if you have a lot more TVL, a lot more fees. And so what he means by like a, you, you have a fully sustainable at a certain TVL, we know how much if we only issue like call it, I don't know, use a round number 300 nodes or 300 lands, we know how many tokens per day that's going to issue, right? Um, so if we have enough players or, or we have enough TVL and they're paying fees out of the system, then that means that we can basically pay those node holders. Uh, we, we basically are like not paying. Like, we, that means that we're basically like paying the, the, the fees coming from those adventures to those kind of landholders, right? And in terms of the printing that's going on. And so there's a certain amount of TVL, we'll call it the break-even TVL, uh, which kind of creates sustainability on, on that end. If that makes sense. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, it does. Um, so the um, and then there's one other part, but that's oh the, yeah, no, go ahead, go ahead. Right, it's a straight part or like the, the ratio part. Yeah, I can. Um, I mean, do you want to? You kind of just you did a really good job with that one. <laughs> I don't know. I don't want to. I don't want you to lose your momentum. I remember them. Yeah. So the other thing that we noticed that was interesting when we looked at the two protocol, we were kind of busting our heads about this. And we, were, we were like, yeah, it's kind of cool. Um, and, and to be frank, like a lot of the code that we pulled is, is from a bunch of these different protocols to, to combine them. So it's not like we built everything from scratch. We like tweaked things based on what we thought the economics would look like. Um, but um, what I would say is that. Uh, when we looked at the tomb protocol, we were like, oh, this is kind of interesting. But the issue with the tomb is that it, it also kept printing kind of forever. And it printed at an exponential rate, right? Like the, they have this thing, these things called the epoch, and then like your 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 the number of tomb or the number of whatever tomb work, just maybe you change the scale or multiplier, but it tends to, it seems to like exponentially increase every single epoch so that you're printing more and more and more. And to us, like that just like just to have that much of a uh, change in, in printing relative to, I think, what are true market conditions, right? Well, what happens is that you print way too much kind of later in the protocol's life, especially, but even kind of earlier. So like, it's really hard to stay above that peg number, whatever. Um, what you really need to us was like, as we mentioned, kind of a, a more dynamic way to basically let the protocol, as we said, right? Like if you're the Federal Reserve, like today looking at inflation, you're like, oh shit, inflation's like 10%, like let's raise the interest rates, right? Not saying that that was the best or the only thing to do but like that's that's a tool that they have you know right yeah and it's the dynamic what's kind of what's going on in the actual economy and so what we wanted to create is, is a tool that we can kind of change based on um based on based on like where where the printing is happening right and so for us there's two places where it prints there's the there's the land part where it's printed and the land part which printed we we kind of uh, deal with with that burn mechanic that i was telling you about uh on the on the adventurer side kind of call it like more of like the you stake the myths that are in the fortune side that's another area that's a, that's the second area of printing right and then um if we have enough tv it'll be kind of the bigger area of printing really but that area of printing we have to control in another way and and that's through this concept of a ratio that we have between myth and fortune uh which kind of drives how much fortune is is printed how much is rewarded out so if we feel like there's too much uh fortune or there's too much supply then we can kind of like Say all right, like if, if, the, if, if, if there's too much, then we're gonna like cut that printing by X amount, um, in a much more dynamic way, so that like we don't have giant kind of price crashes that come with the giant supply rate. Right. So like we're basically setting it so that like we we have that we have that control because we, we can't control like how many people are in our protocol. We can't control how many how much money is going to like kind of go in there. Um, we we the. The, the way that we see the hype is like the, the price of the myth token, right? If there are millions of like adventure going on, like, like if there's like a bunch of money flowing into questing, then then the amount, then the price of myth should like skyrocket, right? But um, for us, that means that like we we have a lot of people in here, but we, we kind of, I don't know, may, might want to limit the printing a little bit more just so that we don't completely over flood the market type of thing, right? So based on that ratio, that's like the other kind of lever that we're, we're sort of... Uh, going to be focused on so both of those combined i think will work to hopefully create like a, a like a true sort of a system of, of balance that uh, within our protocol okay so just so i understand completely so the fees that people are paying to replenish their their adventure um that is that paid in the fortune token yeah okay so that so people are required to you know the, like that's a mechanic of of buy pressure where people have to to buy it to or they can take it from the rewards of course but yeah right um, and you actually don't have to claim it to pay the fees you can pay uh, okay the fees yeah. so you don't have to have your you know your guy at full stats to be able to to replenish yeah exactly so you can well, i guess that would make sense yeah yeah no, 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 I mean, yeah no i i know what you mean yeah you if let's say like the very first time you only have myth right, and you have not generate any fortune, and you want to pay fees to claim your fortune, you can pay the fees from what's in your chest. So, Okay, and then you're going to take a, a portion of those of those fees in the fortune token and burn it, and that's a, a method of deflation. Yep. Exactly. Okay, cool. Not, um, not to mention the 
future utility of like just getting other protocols to use our token, burn it for us, that kind of thing. But yeah. Can you go into that a little bit more in depth? Yeah, sure. So like Battle said, a lot of what we do is um, um, all, all Battle is describing all the burn mechanics internally. Yeah. But a lot of what we can do as well is if we hold a lot of our token and then we, you know, sell it to other protocols to then use in their own ecosystems, well, all these protocols are looking for are tokens that they can issue um, certain amounts of and then have a lot of them be burned as well as something that still holds value. So we can give protocols that are looking for these kind of tokens. And obviously we're not giving this to everyone, right? Um, there's going to be a pretty excruciating vetting process, like from myself and everyone else in the team, like to find the right projects that we want to like, work with. But um, finding protocols that are going to do this kind of thing for us, we can sell them our own token and they can burn a lot for us as well. So okay, gotcha. there's a lot of that. Right. Going. So and that, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say it helps a lot with um, reducing sell pressure because one, we're, you know, selling our token to someone else, that's just going to burn it. So, right. Yeah. That's another way there's, of there's that. And then there's other kind of uh, interesting points as well, right? Which are, again, those character NFTs, they'll probably have to pay for them and get rewards for it. So that's another burn mechanism that we, we kind of have, right? Um, that's more just purely internal, which we kind of launch, launch those. Um, and then... Outside of that, like there's all sorts of interesting kind of we we have in our roadmap like this lending platform, which again once you have like a stabilized token that like is not like completely crashing, because uh, of too much supply, then it has like true true value um, to it. Then you can create like a lending protocol around it also, right? And so it's all about like what can we do? Again, there's the game mechanic side and there's the DeFi mechanic side, right? And it's it's kind of like combining both both of those, right? Yeah, that's awesome. Um, but like we said, if, yeah, if you don't want to participate much in this protocol and you kind of just are the person that you look at it once a week, there that is something that you can do here. But if you want to get more involved, that is also an option, right? You don't have to like, quote unquote, play the game to earn a lot, right? You could earn a lot and not play at all. You could earn a lot and... Um, you know, just go about it like anyone else. So it, it's very much like choose your own path. Like, yeah. Right. Yeah. So you could just kind of, you know, stake your NFT, collect your rewards and then, you know, and, yeah, and just chill and never pay a fee at all until like you want to claim or until you hit that minimum threshold of two at uh, of two stats at zero to five. And then you just teal it back up and then, you know, you don't look at it again for a while. Right. Or you can, you know, if you want to try to, you know, min max it, you can go in depth and exactly. And you can do your own calcs and you could identify what risk tolerance you're comfortable with and optimize your strategy for that. Yeah. There's, there's something cool. for everyone. Yeah. So that kind of goes in line. I want to go over this question. Uh, second one from Lozotica. He said, um, do you expect people to play the game if every time they get on, they might be forced to stop because the value has fallen below the peg? said my first thought would be that people would stop coming back. Um, do you expect people to actually recruit more players? No, no, that's a great question. But I think the the initial thing for this is that the peg, though it's very important for other protocols using our token, we have no intention of ever really going near the peg. And generally speaking, the peg really won't impact Ever, like users day to day, hopefully ever. Um, okay. I completely understand this question because if you've ever been in a tomb fork and that thing keeps going under peg and whatnot, and then you're like, okay, like I guess I got to sell this. Now I have to bond back in. And then the next day it's above and you're like, okay, now I can stake. And then the next day it's lower. Like, it's, yeah, it's, it's a lot of leg work. <laughs> yeah, it's awful. No. Um, yeah. uh, that That's something we've consciously been like thinking about and like, okay, the, the, Biggest problem Tomb Forks go into is that they issue so many tokens to get that thing to around the peg price, and then they'll never hit it again. Or So we're just going to do our own thing, operate as a DeFi protocol with the um, peg being 
you know, the worst case scenario, the safety net at the end. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, so I, it kind of seems like it's more of an assurance, if anything, exactly. that, like, you know, you know, it, it's kind of like you're, okay, this isn't going to fall below this point. Um, yeah, so and think about a mechanism in, in place to, to bring it back. Right, so think about, like, what, um, as I was mentioning a little bit earlier, like, think about, like, what a tomb or a tomb port is, right? It's this thing where over time you get exponentially more and more supply, but, like, your, your demand for that token doesn't necessarily exponentially increase, right? And so, like, a lot of times those things are a lot of hype in the beginning, but then as they start printing more and more and more, they just couldn't keep up with the, the use case or the printing, right? Or something like that. Um, yeah. And and really, the only mechanic to stop that printing was was it going below this quote unquote uh, artificial imaginary peg, uh, which which is whatever it is you can peg to to whatever you want, right? Um, but at the end of the day, it's like what the market supply and demand is. So, I think like for for us, like because we're doing this um, this, this 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 ratio, this uh, interest rate thing I was telling you about. We don't really, as he was saying, we don't really have an intention to like just keep printing, 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 or exponentially printing more and more and more. You know, like this is just like not going to happen mm -hmm. in a protocol. So it's very much so something where uh, that's meant to be really an asymptote of, of like that's by far the worst thing that could happen in our protocol is that like we go below peg. And like the, the, the issue with Tomb, right? And like Tomb ports really is not that they go below peg, it's that they keep going below peg time and time and time again because of this printing mechanism, right? And so, like, you're asking everyone to, to come come back in, right? So, if, if something goes below peg, it should be, like, a huge deal. Like, especially in our protocol, like, it should be, like, all right, now everyone come together because, like, this is only supposed to happen, like, once, a, I don't know, every, every, like, X amount of, like, time, right? You know, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. It's not supposed to happen, like, every week. It's supposed to happen because, like, the, the market got, like, hit on really hard. And now everything's right. Now we need to come together to, like, help this, this one time um or this very rare time like that's what's supposed to that's what that's supposed to represent um another like piece i would just mention is uh, more so like a again like this idea of collateralization right when times are good we should be uh kind of pulling in and like trading and, and again like when we sell to these other game pie protocols like we may or may not be above or below an amount but like or to other people like we're, we're just going to be like getting usdc or some other magic token or their token that we can that's kind of other collateral, right? So we will be um, creating a treasure chest anyway of, of other tokens in, in reserve that it's also meant to kind of help support this thing. But again, like the, the main part of it is that we, we don't see ourselves printing nearly as much as like almost uh, uh, on every other DeFi protocol. So will you guys be farming with that treasury? Uh, like, or is that just going to be kind of held in reserves? Like, are, are, is that going to kind of be put to work to earn you more? You know, to earn you more revenue, or is this more of just like a like an emergency fund? I mean, we're not gonna. I doubt we haven't really thought too much about that. Like, I doubt we're gonna put it in like these like super risky pools or anything. But maybe right. safe pools, right? Like where, but like not not like some like crazy crazy pools, right? Because those are meant to be kind of reserves um, for for us. They're not really meant to be like a hedge fund that we just kind of play with with the money, you know? Okay, gotcha. Cool. Uh, I'm going to move on to the, this kind of second part of his question. He's asking about um, kind of the game itself. Um, so maybe you could kind of clarify. So he said, um, what are the major aspects of gameplay other than the light and dark theme? Do you have any in-game footage? And what are you going to do to avoid players leaving when congestion on Polygon increases? I guess those are kind of two separate questions. So we'll just go with kind of the first one explaining the gameplay, which, you know, I understand like where you guys are coming from, from like a DeFi game perspective but maybe you could just kind of clarify that for him no that's a great question i think legendary would be i just saw you unmute so i'm just going to talk yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, that's, i was eager to answer that question <laughs> um we're constantly working on new elements uh for that piece specifically um we already have and i just shared this with the team last night our visual roadmap will be um, going live completely soon we've already shared our initial roadmap with the community so that's already available. But there's a couple of interesting pieces that I just shared with the team two nights ago. Um, and I, I'm having a visual version of it made right now to go ahead and share with the entire community. Okay. And it's specifically around that aspect verbatim. Um, Rick knows that we've been working on a ton of stuff. Um, me, Vlad, and a lot of other people on the team as well. And we have our separate lore team that's just been writing up a lot of lore and developing a lot of the game-specific things. 
And a lot of that stuff is already done. We've just been kind of trying to push it out in a way that's not also overwhelming for our community because lore cards are next. And what you guys will see with the lore cards that are coming is that they not only tell a story, but they actually have a significance that's going to come later down the line in which you'll actually see the lore happening within the actual protocol. You'll see it in specific NFT drops. They may come in the future, and you'll see how it really kind of affects the whole mythical metaverse in and of itself. So when it comes to gameplay, yeah, we have a lot of things happening um, that we're planning. There's phase two, there's gameplay elements that come in phase three, and there's also seasonal things that we'll be dropping. I like to liken it to Game Pass or even PlayStation Network. Um, you guys that are diehard Call of Duty fans or you guys that love Gears of War as much as I do, think of it like the seasons that were dropped in Gears of War and how you have these entirely new um, characters that came into the play and you had these new terrains and everything. Think of it like that, like we're dropping these expansion packs um, that will allow you to, like I said, traverse different places in the mythical realm, be introduced to new characters, tie in so much of the lore. So the gameplay is something that we're really ecstatic about. Um, and that's really what the team has been discussing behind the scenes. Everything is, like I said, is now really hands on deck or continue to build. And I want to name drop Phoenix because, you know, he's actually the, uh, one of our developers on our project as well. And, you know, Phoenix played a big part um, with Lava as well. Yeah. So wanted to name drop Phoenix and we're working on a ton of cool stuff. That's awesome, man. What a great answer. Uh, yeah, shout out to Phoenix, dude. He's such a pleasure to work with. Um, so yeah, the last question uh, from Lozatica was, what are you going to do to avoid players leaving when congestion on Polygon increases? Now, that's kind of a tough question to answer, but I don't know if you guys have thought that through or not. Yeah, no, that's a good question, especially if you were around when Sunflower came out. Holy, that was... I'm not familiar, actually. It was this thing where... The, the problem was there were so many transactions happening in this one game that it clogged the entire network and gas fees were like a dollar or something on Polygon. It was, oh damn. It was insane. Um, but the beauty of our game is that, uh, there's not a lot of transactions happening that the person would have to make. Um, a lot of them are more, outside the interface like okay what do you want to do like how do you want to play rather than you know actually like making moves or you know doing wallet transactions so fortunately for us we're not going to be the ones congesting it that being said i know polygon has specifically addressed the problem like okay like yeah like these congestions kind of happen and polygon is one of the more popular um as we were talking about chains earlier, is one of the more popular chains for games specifically and like NFT type games and whatnot. So they're trying to work. I, I we're all obviously we're all saying this like speculatively, but we are all hoping that Polygon can kind of like you know figure that out so that in the future, like when more people are building on Polygon, especially like something like Facebook, um, <laughs> the infrastructure is there to support it. So I think right. if you're bullish on metaverse and I guess big money coming into the crypto at all, then I'm bullish on Polygon just for the fact that probably the biggest player in anything metaverse oriented outside of crypto is coming into Polygon. I think infrastructure there is just going to be like pseudo guaranteed. Um, but to his point, I think from our end, people aren't, I, I don't see people leaving because the transactions are so few. If, if we were a game where you had to make like a transaction every hour or so, or even more right. than that, like then I could totally see that. But, you know, you, like we were talking before, if you want to log in and you want to, you know, do your thing like once every week, that's totally fine. Like you'll be able to make money. You'll be able to earn fortune um, in our protocol. Um, right. I, I think that's like an emphasis, right? Like the space layer is very much so the times that you're on chain is when you're staking you're unstaking you're going to these other places everything else like doesn't need to be on chain so like you're not going to have that much kind of transactions um and so right it's pretty limited so it's not it's not like uh you're gonna have to transact every like 10 seconds or every few minutes that you're in the game you know it's like very very kind of sporadic Right. So if you just want to be like, okay, I'm just going to wait a bit till gas fees die down, you know, wait till it's middle of the night or something. I, you know, I can do my 
my character replenish or whatever and just wait it off. Exactly. Cool. Awesome. Um, question from Swedwin. Um, he said, I've seen your land NFTs, which will be exclusive. Can you tell us how many quantities of each will be available and when on the roadmap they are launched? I think, yeah, um, I think we can give like rough numbers. We don't want to give exact numbers, but we can give like ranges. Okay. If that works. Yeah. Did you want to say something? <clears throat> yeah. So basically the tavern, the first one that we're releasing uh, tomorrow, uh, each one will sell for 250 USDC. We're going to release about a hundred of them. Um, and the max supply of it is 200. Uh, each whitelist spot can buy up to five. If there's like a huge demand of, of these, then we'll might release kind of, uh, to, from 100, we might like push it up to like 150, or like if there's even a lot more than like to that max level. But that's the most amount of, of these uh, tier one tavern uh, NFT lands. The other two, uh, the blacksmith and the temple, um, the legendary, I don't know if you have like the actual numbers in, in front of you, but both of those combined, I'm pretty sure, are like 100, 250. The tier one, or sorry, the tier three temple, there's only going to be like 15 of them total. Um, and so it's going to be very, very limited. Uh, if you hold a tavern, then you're going to get certain um, benefits in the process of getting these very limited next tier NFTs in the sense of like if you're a tavern holder or a multiple tavern holder, then uh, you'll be, you might like, like we're, we're, we're thinking about doing for, because there's only going to be like 10 or 15 of the tier three temples. We're probably going to do like some sort of an auction around it. So if you own like a tavern or like multiple taverns, you might have a multiplier on the bid that you put in type of thing. Um, okay. So something like that where like it's, it's more valuable that you kind of uh, invested in us early type of thing. So we highly recommend kind of getting into this because it's the most kind of highest uh, number and also the, uh, the, uh, the a ticket or more of a ticket into kind of those other ones. And that's going to be sort of, uh, I think two ish weeks from, from tomorrow's kind of the goal just to have that release like two, two to three weeks, uh, from I guess tomorrow or like this weekend. So, uh, it's all kind of coming up and then, call it like another two to three weeks after that is kind of going to be the, the bootstrap launch, right? And um, so it's kind of all coming up, but um, this is kind of the, the first step. I don't know, Legendary, if I missed anything. Or if I, what? No, absolutely. I think um, Battle pretty much summed it up very, very well and is what we've been telling everybody. Um, it's not just hype. It's not just um, us trying to get you to, to get excited. It's just our community has been going absolutely nuts. The Twitter spaces have been really, really crazy. The AMAs have been really crazy. The whitelist spots have been really, really feeling like extremely fast. And I just foresee that they're, and especially because of the um, different private conversations that people have been messaging me and having, a lot of these taverns are going to be extremely hard to get. But we really want to have as many people have the opportunity to get them. Because if you're not able to get a tavern, the next pre-sale um, for the blacksmith and the temple, they're going to be almost impossible to get unless you want to be um, involved with trying to outbid somebody else. So, but those do come with their own benefits as well. So we've been really pushing a lot of people to say, hey, do your best to try and get a tavern, get yourself involved, because even those have tons and tons and tons of benefits. If we look at some of our roadmap items even further down the line and you understand that your item your land represents actual land in our mythical metaverse, you have to understand that we have way more in store for you just for even owning that because as a land owner, you own a piece of the mythical realm and that comes with tons of benefits in and of itself. Okay. Yeah. And the other point I just emphasize here is like the way that we're doing it, um, again, 250 bucks at 100, max 200 or like 150. And it's not that much money for a pre-sale, right? It's like 25 max 50k like that's not like a huge amount of money like relatively speaking but we want to be like really really uh careful that we don't like kind of raise too much too early right because what, what do we need this for we're, we're going to use this money um to do the audit to kind of do some marketing pay like some dev work to just kind of finish this up forward like none of us like who kind of are like the, the core team are, are taking any money off of this first round at all uh probably like we aren't even like paying ourselves back from it probably. So it's very much so just meant to kind of like do this initial kind kind of raise, get the community hype and like reinvest basically all of it 
back into the project. Um, and so it's very much so like meant to be that sort of around. It's, it's very limited. It's meant to generate kind of the, the hype. Um, we're very much so going to like uh, tell everyone where the money went, which is directly to kind of reinvest for, for the future of this project. And um, those other rounds that coming up are going to basically be invested to get to kind of that bootstrap round, right? So like that's kind of like where where we are. And again, we're not we're not going to be like pre-sailing like a million dollars or millions of dollars because like or even like half a mil, right? Like the, all of our pre-sales combined are going to be like way way below kind of like what some pre-sales are like, just because like we don't we feel like to be truly incentivized in the long term, like we as a team should only be making money if the protocol is doing well over the long term. So we don't need to be like pre-sailing like huge amounts of money up front. Yeah, 100%. Yeah. yeah um, so just to kind of kind of lump that all together and reiterate. So the there's the, the tavern sale is tomorrow. It's five taverns max per whitelisted user. Yeah. yeah. And each one is 250. So you have 1250 as your, as your max buy for a whitelist spot. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Great. And then in two weeks, it's going to be the blacksmith and the temple sale. Yes. Okay. Um, are you auctioning off all of those, you know, like as a like as a presale, or are there going to be more auctioned off, like later once you guys launch or anything like that? No, uh, they're, they're, we're yeah. not going to release any more once we are okay. completed these yet. So everything is going to be all the all the land NFTs are going to be distributed and sold before you guys launch. I will say this, and I think this is what Rick was alluding to before, that if we do, it's going to be a very rare chance that we do. The, okay. the whole basis is that these are purely sustainable by the by the existing protocol. Right. For our standpoint, we can't justify releasing them unless one, I mean, in full transparency, we sell it for a shitload, right? Like like later right. down the line, um, I'm t we're talking like months or like even like years after this um or two the protocol has gotten like crazy out of the hand and then these these nodes that were worth 250 are worth like tens of thousands of dollars right like i mean we all saw if you guys watched what happened with um any of the like big nft games the things auctioned off for the land auctioned off for you know a thousand bucks is now worth like 50 grand or something like that so if that's the kind of situation we find ourselves in, in order to make it more accessible for people who really care about the project, we might be incentivized to issue more later, but okay. only if it makes sense from a protocol standpoint. But as of right now, those are kind of our caps and we don't plan on ever releasing right. anymore. I mean, like the only time we'd release more, right, is if it's if like the original people are super in the money, uh, the protocol is like, looking for like we're, we're looking for ways to reward and like it doesn't feel bad to kind of like release more and it would be very limited again right like post sale but this number that we're saying that's called 300 350 max is kind of where we expect to be for the land for 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 a while right um, okay I, I would say like guaranteed minimum is like six months absolute min like minimum is that's like the top like 350 is like the very top but okay is there, is there a chance like absolutely but like not even something we're considering at all <laughs> okay yeah because you guys want these to increase in value you know you want a limited supply you want them to presumably go up in value over time so yeah, yeah i totally get it um so do you this is just kind of a question i thought of do you need to own a land nft to be able to replenish your character or can oh no no, is no. it is it just oh like owning it gives you a share of people that are replenishing their characters. Exactly. Like okay. I like to think of it as these lands are almost completely irrelevant to probably 95% of people that are um, interacting with their protocol. Right. Okay. Like you could exist completely fine without even knowing people own the land. Um, gotcha. Okay. It, this is purely just a bonus. Like if you like, you know, maybe if it's your you, share of the protocol. Yeah. Like you yeah. get like a percentage of the fees paid. Like that's yeah. Like, um, but you know for most people who don't have a land like that's totally fine you can you know go on quests you can replenish your character you can do everything you just don't realize that you're paying fees to the landholders but yeah right right one other point to emphasize right is like and you can kind of do the math there's gonna be um 100 taverns launched now kind of 200 total supply at some point um 
but let's just say like there's like a hundred crazy numbers one out of a hundred times like that percentage of fees is kind of what that tavern holders kind of share of those fees will be like it gets airdropped okay that person right um but if you own a temple and there's only 15 of those temples then it's one out of 15 times like the the share of those fees right are those airdrop so, like, as fortune or are they airdropped as a different token airdrop as, as fortune okay so, yeah, so you dropped more of the, the fortune token, right? But like, gotcha. and like as a temple holder, as like a T3 or T2, I mean, even as a T1, right? Like the TVL is huge. Like you're hopefully making a decent amount more off those fees even maybe than some of the APR. But like for the temple holder, or for the blacksmith holder, right? Like much more limited, that share is, is higher, you know, of what you're getting because it's just less, less denominator. Right, right. Okay. Um, have you guys kind of solidified the, because you mentioned that, that like that there could be a boost um, for owning a tavern for when the temple and blacksmith sale happens. Is that something that you've kind of set in stone or is that just kind of up in the air? There will be a boost. Um, okay. Just in terms of like, again, we haven't worked up the full mechanics, but like if you own like multiple taverns, like, and you invest in us like this early, like we feel that you should get our reward. Yeah, uh, and it means that uh, you basically it, for for the temple, right? Like you're, I'm just using round numbers again, but like maybe if you bought like five taverns, like each tavern gives you like a two percent boost to the bid that you have. So like you're one, they're like, I'm using another round number, like your, I don't know, five thousand dollar bid might be worth like fifty five hundred dollars or something, right? Or six thousand dollars. Like you might have some sort of a, a jumper relative to everyone else who didn't invest in that tavern. Okay. Um, yeah. And so that's like, that's what I mean by like, there'll be kind of a boost. Okay. Like your, your value, your worth of what you put into it um, this early is going to give you like rewards later. Awesome. Um, and it, are those auctions being held on your site or on an, like an external site? Um, uh, let, we, go ahead. I'm sorry, guys. No, I was going to say, go ahead. Oh, yeah. So before. the, um, Auctions will actually be held on our actual site. Okay. Yeah, yep. that functionality will be activated later. Um, we've already had all those things tested. We have already been building those things in the background. Um, Cryptopus and Phoenix will be going over that as soon as this um, phase of the pre-sale wraps up. Okay. And is the Blacksmith and Temple auction, is that fully public? Or is there any kind of whitelist restriction on that as well? So, of course, there'll be... Um, more details released in the coming weeks. I would okay. say expect details on that specifically, and this is not me just trying to avoid the question. I would say just um, expect details on that specifically because we're going to be rolling out a ton of information come Monday. So I would say expect all of those questions to be answered on Monday and fully detailed in our Discord. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think I think the concept of uh, boost is the right way to potentially think about it, though. Like different the amount of involvement that you have in our protocol this early uh, will give you like certain legs up probably uh, relative to like the general public. Okay. Um, how long is your, is the pre-sale tomorrow lasting for the taverns? So there's, it's going to be coming in two ways. If you are on the light path, um, AKA the Oracle's apprentice role, you'll actually be able to mint at, um, earlier than the actual specific mint time, which is when it will open up for the other whitelisted users, those who are on the dark path, um, also known as Leviathan's Pawn. So the first, and you can actually see these stats in our server stats as well. Um, anybody that needs more reference that may um, not hear this specifically. Um, the Oracle's presale actually starts at 8 a.m. and that's universal um, UCC, of course. And then also the Leviathan presale will be at 8 p.m. UTC. And these are all happening tomorrow. So you have, um, for the Oracles, you have about 12 hours before the Leviathan presale starts at 8 p.m. UTC. And then okay. that will last for another 24 hours before it's completely done. So the presale should end at 8 p.m. UTC on Saturday. That is correct. Okay. Okay, and is there any benefit to going with the, I assume there's something that kind of benefit to going with the dark side? 
Or is oh, that kind absolutely. of a surprise? <laughs> <laughs> there is, there is, there is. And uh, Vlad's on the call. I don't want to spoil it for him because, you know, he, he loves to drop these things in lore with Vlad um, in our community events. Uh, okay. so like our time with Vlad. But I actually tell you, um, if you do choose the dark side, it does come with a lot of more immediate benefits. Um, okay. Just because how it works is you're essentially working for one of our biggest quote-unquote villains. Um, and by doing his bidding, you actually do uh, obtain a lot of really cool benefits. However, it does come with a price, and you'll definitely get to see that later on. I think a lot of people on the protocol will be surprised. Um, but once you do level up to that Leviathan's Bane um, role, and we hope to get a lot of people to that through their activity and earning mythic points, you'll actually understand that there's a lot of cool opportunity that you can um, unlock with those mythic points that you'll earn, the boosters that you'll actually be able to get. Um, you might be able to earn mythic points faster, for example, due to being on the dark path. And those mythic points, of course, are going to be exchangeable for a lot of cool prizes. Okay. Do you have any examples of some of those prizes? Oh, man, this guy wants me to drop a lot of alpha. <laughs> I, I know. Alpha. I don't want to push you to – I don't want to spoil everything, but, you know, maybe just like a little – tidbit for you know for those that are listening no absolutely so um one of the things for sure that you will be able to um use your mythic points for is access to specific protocol specific things in the future and okay. let me be a little bit more clear about that so let's say for example that the mythical realm happens to be running a specific event and is for specific people with certain roles those mythic points will not only be able to allow you to have governance opportunities, but they'll also allow you to be able to get in on some exclusive drops, whether that might be um, some partnerships that we have and there's a benefit from the partnership. You can get in on that early. It might be a whitelist collab that we have and you might get exclusive access to that whitelist, or it might mean that you're able to participate in any future drops that we have way before anybody else. So you're almost buying um, your place into it with mythic points. And um, mythic points may, and this is a this is um, something that we're still working on. They may be exchangeable for different items that you can actually use on the DF, but that's something that we're still planning. That's awesome. All right. Um, kind of this kind of ties in with with the light and dark theme as well. Uh, got a question from Danny he said, uh, if the light and dark path have different buying opportunities, how will the experiences be between the two groups? Uh, more so, the main question, will it affect your financial decisions in addition to just the gameplay? I guess honestly, I um, can't answer that, but... I know some people out there are Harry Potter fans, right? Of so you have the, you, of course, you have the two different houses, you have the two different factions. I think what we're doing is saying that if you choose the light path, if you choose the dark path, you're automatically already taking your side. And you can click up with your teammates. And this is another thing that, um, and I'll give credit to you, Recon, for um, coming up with this uh, idea for the Mythic Point system as well. You're going to essentially be competing against those Oracle Apprentices, those on the light path, and those that are choosing to side with different houses in the realms. Um, and you want your specific quote-unquote house to do a lot better than the other ones. Why? Because that mm. earns you more fortune. We always say what? Our slogan is fortune favors the mythic, mythic ones. So you could earn fortune for being the most favored of the houses. Um, so it really is a lot of people grouping together, working together, um, engaging in different contests, quizzes, um, and different protocol-specific events, and trying to rack up as many mythic points as possible because we will have like a leaderboard and everything that's coming soon with that. And you want to earn as much as you possibly can for your specific faction okay. because that will earn you guys the more favorable um, opportunities. So it could go either way. You know, it just depends gotcha. on if the light side is doing more than the dark side, the dark side is outshining the, the light side. Okay. And this is something where you get like a role in your server on, on your discord server. Absolutely. Okay. Awesome. Um, I think, and, to put that further, I think the goal yeah. is to have specific factions have specific, you know, gear that they can get in when we get to phase two. Yeah. So there's 
lots of different interactions we plan to have with the mythic point system as well as the light and dark path like integrating into the protocol too okay um i saw this question earlier is there a limit uh, like a wallet limit to how many lands you can have like is, in is total there, or specifically yeah. for the event tomorrow uh in total like is there a global like wallet limit where you know if you have 15 lands then like you can't receive any more or something is there any kind of like restriction there or is it uh no so uh my and not my uh my philosophy is if someone wants to buy up every single node they're gonna do it if they can do it in one wallet or they have to make five wallets for it right so right yeah of course so we don't have a cap we don't plan to have a cap it, a cap's kind of just like something that gets in the way that's annoying for people if they really want to do it they'll just make more wallets <laughs> right right um so i take it that people can transfer them between yep. wallets and, okay yeah, yeah. It, it are these are like tradable nfts right like the only node element is the fact that you can stake it and uh, get a return okay gotcha um kind of going back to the, the the two sides a question from Danny. He said, will there be an opportunity to pay later on to switch sides if you realize, like, hey, I went down the light path or dark path and I'm not really feeling it. Can I change and go, you know, is there a way to switch? Okay, so for that, um, there will be a way to switch. I'm going to say it won't be easy if you're on the dark path just because, okay. you know, in our lore, Leviathan is a pretty, pretty cruel master. So, um, okay. But there will be a way to get back on the light path if you choose. Okay. Um, Lava my cast asks where where do we invest our money for tomorrow? Is there a DAP? I assume it's going to be like on your guys' site or. Yes. So for tomorrow, you will be able to actually purchase um, your land at mythicx.io. And we will be dropping that link. Um, we've already been dropping tons of previews of the actual site. It's already finished. We're just doing our routine finalized testing. You know, um, as a dev myself, you know, we never stop testing till like the last possible hour. Oh yeah, so we're constantly testing, and we're testing again at 9 p.m. tonight. So okay. we just ask that nobody um, go there just yet until maybe about midnight. If you just want to go ahead and peruse it. But um, and that's midnight U.S. Eastern, but it's going to be at mythicx.io. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, I know I'm going back up. The, the Mythic X chat has been kind of popping off. I'm going. I, I think there was one. Oh, here. Well, I'll let, I'll go through this one quick. So Danny asks if the gameplay is in 2D or 3D. Um, I guess that would pertain to your website. Yeah, it would be in, 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 again, I'll let you. It's actually interesting. Um, our assets are made in 3D. Oh, very so cool. We do have capabilities, but right now it's mostly 2D. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, there was a question way earlier that I just wanted to go over. Um, here it is. So Godless Soldier asked if there's going to be lending. I think you guys kind of hinted on that as maybe like a long-term thing, but can you go over that quick? Uh, you're uh, referring to Mythic Lend? I think so, yeah. Um, I'll leave that for Rick and Battle if they... I mean, it's on our roadmap. We talked about it before. I don't know how much detail you guys want to go into about yeah, Mythic Lend. Battle, you you want to take that one? I know that's kind of... You want to go for it? You want... Or you want... No, you, you take it. Matt, you can go ahead. Yeah, so... Um, the idea behind the lending protocol, right, is around the fact that something is lendable when it has a store of value, right? And especially, like, a minimum value, but um, also kind of, like, some range of, of stable value, right? And so... Um, Eventually, like like because of the way that we can uh, control supply, this is something that we're going to be testing. Obviously, when we first launch to a few weeks to a month or two, right, or a few months before we even like decide to maybe go down this path. But like we'll we'll, we'll kind of be testing it to see like how to keep this uh, thing at the, in the right range. Then all of a sudden, like it becomes kind of a, a lendable or like a, a token that has value, okay. right? Because said like it's not going to go to zero. When something has value, uh, that's like 
not going to go to zero um, and that's not going to like crash then um and a lot of it's driven by utilities a lot of it's driven by like all these different things that we said that like we're probably going to do or we are going to do in kind of the coming like months but like then you can kind of do something along the lines of what MIM did with their Abra system in terms of having like collateral that ends up being fortune token um, and then you can kind of lend against it with other tokens, right? In a way, when we're asking treasuries to, uh, or game by protocols to buy these from us, that's a little bit like what we're doing, right? Um, and, if, and then we can ask them, once they buy it from us, to be like, hey, by the way, like we have this new lending pro program that works exclusively with Fortune. Um, and you guys can okay. take those, those tokens and like lend against them. And then you just kind of have like a, a different sort of a, a protocol that's built across lending also, right? And that's like another way to, to kind of have use cases for, for this token. And so that's something that we're um, thinking about kind of a little bit like, I wouldn't say it's going to happen right when we launch because um, we're going to be very focused on the mechanics of both the, the game and, and how these different levers work together. Yeah, sure. Um, you got to build it up as well. you got to get that liquidity built up. Right, exactly. So that's where, right, like, and that's where, like, we think there could be a lot of uh, value in terms of the token use too, right? And ultimately right if this becomes like one of the, the the end goal is for this to become like one of as we said like uh the mim equivalent of matic or, or for for app app the mim equivalent on polygon uh then that's very much so like a further down the line road right where you're basically building towards that you're issuing the right amount at the right time you're getting people to use it you're going to lend against it and then it just kind of grows and grows and so that's what we mean by like the, the lending side okay awesome um, I think I've covered most of the questions from the mythic chat. I know, I think Larry had a couple questions. I've, I've kind of been talking the whole time. Um, did you still want to, I, 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 I think you asked you most, I think you asked most of them to be honest with you. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what we haven't yeah, covered. Cost of NFTs, um, the fees to replenish player stats. Yeah, I mean, do you got have you guys sort of hashed out the um, the numbers as yet? Because I know you know, as you say, you're, you're a little bit or you're in the very early stages. But do you know details on, for example, what the APY is going to be for quests, or are they going to be variable? Um, you also mentioned at the towards the end of the pipe, the white paper levels. Um, presumably, as you play more quests, you sort of level up your characters. So, what are the sort of implications of leveling up? Do you receive like an increased APY for a leveled up character, all that sort of stuff? Or can you just talk about that a little bit? Um, Ryan, do you want to go on the fees because you were working on the, the model on on the latter one? Like, that's kind of the the mechanics of how it'll work, right? Like. Let's say that your character NFT buys a sword NFT, or like it's your sword is tagged to your character when we launch phase two, or makes it go up a level, right? That might juice up your modifiers a little bit. Maybe that makes you fail a little less. You know, like there's different things and different combinations can do different things. Again, it's meant to be gamified, choose your own adventure. So like that's what like we mean. And at the end of the day, obviously it'll impact the APR. It'll just be like how it impacts it, right? Like what what stats does it modify? What things are going on? Um, and so that's kind of the, that question. Um, yeah, Ryan, do you want to go on the other one on, on the fees? Yeah. Hey. On the, in terms of the fees, our philosophy is the temple will pay the most fees of anything in the protocol uh, in terms of where it will give the most return over anything in the protocol. Um, that's just like how we kind of optimize everything and how our philosophy is if you're going to buy this NFT and you're going to be so instrumental to this project, you deserve to get the best reward. Thus, also increasing the value of said NFT. But you can kind of say, like, the there's no fixed rate. You know, we're not offering, like, bajillions of APY or anything. Well, I think he's asking about the player fees. So, like, the, the player. Yeah, yeah. So, I'm, I'm, my point in this is there's no fixed APY or APR. It's adjustable. It'll vary. But it'll always be similar to what the uh what the land is paying out but nothing higher than the temple so it would be the like for example the temple would be 200 percent, and then you're saying the the temple fees would be around 200 percent as well no no, not the no, no this is this is if you're staking myth in oh, the class. He's, he's, he's talking about the fee okay gotcha okay Fetus. he's stuck i think he's talking about the fee that like the adventurer pays to uh the the land 
Like, I think I'm not sure though. No, is that what you're talking all, about? all I'm saying is like the the adventurer is getting an APR that's less than what the temple is given. Okay. Right. And then the percentage of that is like the fee that's paid to the temple, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's going to be like generally less than what's in the loot. Like each level that your character uh, goes down, basically, like if it goes from five to four to three, like you have to pay a little bit bigger of a fee um, because just your level is lower. So that if you go from like level one to like you heal from one to five, you're gonna have to pay like a bigger fee. I can't remember. I think we did it like when we were when we were trying to model out. It was kind of like exponential, right? It's In not. One way. It's not exponential. Yeah. It, so it decreases exponentially. So the difference between four and five is less than the difference between four and three, right? Um, just because okay. it it we we want it always to be profitable to pay fees if someone wants to you know get more integrated in pro protocol or like figure out the most optimal method. So it'll always be profitable to pay fees, but um, it might not be. Sorry, could you, could you define what you mean by it'll always be profitable? Yeah, so for instance, the, the amount, the difference in the amount you'll get paid out versus the amount the fee costs will always be higher if you paid the fee versus if you didn't, right? Okay. Um, yeah. So there's no scenario where the fees are going to outweigh what you're, like what you're getting in return. Well, so that's where it's interesting. It depends on one, what, um, and this is more so for phase two, but what equipment you're wearing, and two, your risk tolerance. So if you don't care as much about failing at a 95% rate versus a 90 90% rate, then that fee is kind of wasted for you to pay. And some people might just be totally fine sitting at 10 days rather than five because they don't want to pay. Um, in, in all transparency, like the the highest fee is going to be the temple fee because it's the most expensive. Mm -hmm. um, but also because it ties to the amount of days paid, which if you do the math actually um, ha is the biggest hit to your APR. So but some people might be fine like waiting for 10 days and they don't care and they might just leave it. Right. So it's very much, you know, how you want to play. Like you don't have to do the fees if you don't want to. Okay. Gotcha. And for the, um, for the adventurers then, are you limited to one character per wallet or could you potentially run multiple characters? Yeah, it's a great question. So pre phase two, any amount of myth you stake kind of just gives you one character. Um, that character is like resembling a view. You can't put equipment on it because um, it's not its own NFT. When we get to phase two, each character is going to have a certain amount of myth it can carry, if you want to think of it like that. So for instance, like if you buy like a warrior or something, that warrior can hold maybe, I don't know, like a thousand dollars worth of myth. Then you could put modifiers on that. And then anything that left over, you can create, you know, the standard phase one character. So there's going to be multiple characters that you can have that have different amounts of myth because you might want to put different modifiers on them. Um, but that's more so for phase two. But at, in terms of phase one, it's very general. There's only one character. Um, yeah. Okay. Okay, cool. Awesome. Um, did you have any other questions, Larry? Or And then I kind of, you know, I'll extend that out to anyone that's listening. Um, if you're listening and you're in general, uh, we're kind of we've been pulling questions from the Mythic X channel, um, so just kind of go ahead and post them up as a kind of a last, you know, a last go around. But yeah, did you have any more? No, nothing more from me. Only that, um, yeah, I'd be really interested to see how your how your protocol develops. It's a really interesting idea. I love what you guys are doing, and um, I'm sure I will have more questions as you start going through the phases. But uh, yeah, I think you've given everyone really good. Um, good baseline of what, you know what your project is and what you're trying to do and um yeah it's, it sounds really interesting so no i think we've covered everything yeah i mean i think you guys did, you did a great job of explaining the whole thing it sounds it seems like it's a complex but also you know for a reason like it's you know it has its its game elements and um yeah i'm super excited to to get involved myself as well so um yeah. anything else you wanted to to share kind of as like a you know Kind of before we close One, it out, the last thing I'll say, and probably legendary, was going to have some closing remarks too. Yeah, um, we're all about transparency and 
you know, sharing pretty much anything with our community. If anyone has any questions or any wants to like dig in deeper, like feel free to message anyone on our team. We'll be happy to answer any questions you guys have. Um, but yeah, that, that's all I wanted to say. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'd say one thing um, before Legendary closes is that, uh, again, what we're trying to do here, right? And it started with a lot of different ideas. It started with looking at how the different DeFi protocols kind of work, but were there good things? What was really cool was that you see these communities come together, but then they'd sort of uh, print too much and like the value would go down. But there's also this aspect of game games, right? So what we're doing is that we're creating this game element, which is kind of like going to keep the community together, help them grow, help help get the get this get us get this token out, um, use that as sort of this initial bootstrap um, to to kind of get this token out. Obviously, we're going to develop the game and that whole ecosystem. But then the bigger vision is to then use that token across the Matic ecosystem in, in the different ways that we've kind of done. And obviously, like for for the early people, which is this community of people who are starting with the land sales and starting with uh, the the token launch even, right? If that's kind of the phase, like those are the early people, like it's going to be very good for the early investors, right? Mm -hmm. um, if, if that vision actually comes to fruition, but like it's meant to play on different levels, right? Where the gamified element is meant to really like keep the community together at the community level, at the, at the token and token use level. But then you have these different use cases that that's kind of the DeFi vision of the project. But the game game vision of it is very much so there and intact and meant to kind of uh, again like facilitate like this feeling of having fun, choosing your own adventure to get to an outcome, right? You're you're kind of yeah, yeah. So that's kind of how I describe it. Awesome. Yeah, absolutely. I think that um, that, I mean the way that battle just summed it up is like definitely how we should close. You know, the the vision of this whole project is really to be a lifeblood to a lot of other projects. So we're looking to really be in support of a lot of the, the ecosystem and even with you guys hosting us we want to say thank you so much to everybody that came out and thank you to the entire lava team you guys have been very accommodating you guys are an excellent team i've been following your project now for a while um so thank we're just so happy that. to be able to, to share yeah yeah guys thank you so much for coming on i you know we appreciate it. we're and feel free to you know if you want to come back on in the future if something's you know big announcement and you want to do another one then you know you're always welcome yeah real quick what are, are we doing a whitelist giveaway legendary or was the yes um yeah everybody so we're are we are giving away some whitelist spots to everybody that's been here um just as a token of a thank you for the um hospitality that's been shown by the lava community so we will actually be hosting the giveaway in our server you can okay. come to um, our server and there should be a spot that says whitelist giveaway under our sneak peek section. So if you come into our Discord, just go to the whitelist giveaway section and just click on um, the bot to react and you'll automatically be entered in the giveaway. Okay, awesome. Yeah, thank you guys. Appreciate it. Um, I'm sure we'll have enough, we'll have plenty of people to fill up those spots. Um, but yeah, okay. Um, I know Larry's recording, so you know we'll get that over to you as soon as we can, and uh, yeah, we'll close it off here. Thank you guys so much for coming on, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, awesome. guys. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, guys. It's been an absolute blast. Of course, you got it in two hours. Yeah, man. We're really quick. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Take it easy. Have a good night. Awesome. Take care. Thanks, right. guys. Bye now.